participate in this uh, 200th New England Journal anniversary. The New England Journal has been a co-partner to all of us here who've been in this journey fighting and trying to overcome AIDS for the last 31 years or so. And the New England Journal has certainly published uh, many of the most important articles that have changed this field. Uh, now, I remember vividly sitting in my office uh, 31 years ago this month, uh, reading the first report in the CDC Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report of five previously healthy young men who had sex with men in Los Angeles who had a curious constellation of opportunistic infections, and these were fatal infections. And there was a very prescient note by the editors of the MMWR saying that this syndrome might be related to a defect in cell-mediated immunity, and this might in turn be associated with a sexually transmitted infection. And all of that has turned out to be true, and we've come an enormously long way since then, and all of the participants on this panel have been intimately involved in one way or another on this journey. I think the first thing we're gonna do is each briefly introduce ourselves and uh, for more details, you can read uh, the program and there'll be more things in there. Starting with myself, uh, I'm Marty Hirsch. I'm a professor of medicine at uh, Harvard and a physician at the Mass General Hospital. I saw my first patient with AIDS in 1981 and have been conducting AIDS research and, and doing AIDS clinical care since that time. And the research that we've done is primarily in uh, pathogenesis and treatment, uh, helping to develop the combination therapies for HIV that now characterize this field. So we can just go down the list here. On my left uh, is David, and he can introduce himself. I just want to say that he was one of the, my early fellows working in this field. It's been all downhill for David since that time, but he can go ahead and uh, introduce the rest of his life. Thank you, Marty. Uh, I'm David Ho. Uh, I was a student living next door. Um, and after that, uh, I went out west and in LA saw my first case of AIDS in 1980, which uh, piqued my interest and, and I've been in the field ever since. Uh, I work on HIV pathogenesis, uh, did a, fair amount of work on, on treatment, and these days I'm working on HIV prevention. I am uh, the scientific director of Aaron Diamond AIDS Research Center in New York, and I'm a professor at the Rockefeller University. I'm Beatrice Hahn. I'm a professor of medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. I actually moved there only a year ago uh, and spent the previous 25 years uh, in Birmingham at the University of Alabama. I don't see patients, I see apes. In fact, I see what they leave behind. My research, <laughs> has, uh, my, my research interests have been uh, origin and evolution of HIV and primate lentiviruses, and more recently, uh, plasmodium parasites. <clears throat> my name is Bob Massey. I'm the president of the New Economics Institute. I'm here because I was born with severe factor eight hemophilia. Uh, from that, contracted HIV in uh, 1978 um, and went on to contract hepatitis C, and then later was asked to speak about these uh, uh, experiences at uh, Brigham Women's Hospital, and then later at Mass General, and somehow that led here. So I'm uh, <laughs> happy, to, happy to talk a little bit more about that during my time. Thanks, Bob. I'm <clears throat> Paul Farmer, and I'm uh, representing today the, the clinician's voice to some extent, as other people here can. Um, I, uh, after graduating from college in 1982, um, and before coming to, to medical school here, um, I spent a year in Haiti. And um, I was you know, 23 years old. It was also the, the same, time that it, same year that it became clear uh, that, this, that there was a new pathogen on the block. Um, and, and that was a HIV, of course. But there were also longstanding problems uh, with tuberculosis, even malaria. Uh, and so I ended up going into... Uh, infectious disease, um, and also to study these epidemics. I'm a medical anthropologist uh, and have been involved not only in the care 
of people living with chronic infectious disease, uh, but also in the last decade, in a no small amount of thanks to the guy on my left, uh, to building uh, very ambitious platforms for uh, the care of not hundreds of patients, but tens of thousands of patients with HIV, first in Haiti, and, and more recently in, in Rwanda, Malawi, Lesotho, and some of the other much more effective parts of the world. And I'm uh, still at, the, uh, at Harvard Medical School on the Brigham uh, all these years later, um, and, uh, and glad to be, be here with all of you today. My name is Tony Fauci, and I'm the director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, I also was uh, involved in the HIV AIDS pandemic literally from the very first weeks of its being reported, having seen my first patient at the NIH in the summer of 1981, and I have been studying uh, HIV from a clinical and basic research standpoint <coughs> over the last 31 years in my lab studying uh, pathogenic mechanisms of HIV. But also as the director of the institute, I've been heavily involved in the effort of supporting researchers, many of which we see uh, here on the panel, in the extraordinary journey that we've all taken over the last 31 years in going from a disease that was essentially universally fatal and completely not understood to the point where today we have an extraordinary opportunity to have a major impact on this in the future. Okay, now that we've uh, finished the introductions, I think we're going to go ahead with the topic at hand and and start with an overview by Tony Fauci of the first 30 plus years of the epidemic. And let me just say that, in my view, no person in the field uh, deserves more credit for the progress that's been made against this virus and this disease than Tony. Not only has he done outstanding research in his own laboratory, he has very wisely directed the national effort at the NIH from the start of the epidemic up to the present time. And I think of no one else who could have done the job better. Tony, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marty. It's a real pleasure to be here with you this morning to participate in the celebration of the 200th anniversary of the New England Journal of Medicine. I was asked by the organizers to give a, about a less than 15 minute overview of the 30 years of HIV to set the stage for the panel discussion which will follow, and I will uh, do that task right now. I'm gonna take a broad stroke overview, a little bit historic, and then tell you about some of the advances. I too, like Marty in his introduction, was struck as I was sitting in my office at the National Institutes of Health in Building 10, where my lab was, when I saw that first morbidity and mortality weekly report showing that there were five men from Los Angeles who were presenting with pneumocystis pneumonia. It was very curious to us who were in infectious disease at the time, why gay men and why otherwise well. Didn't know what that was until one month later, in July 4th of that year, 26 additional, again, young gay men, otherwise well, who now were presenting not only with PCP, but with Kaposi sarcoma and other opportunistic infections, not only in LA, but in San Francisco, New York, and uh, Los Angeles. Um, this was followed a couple of months later by the now iconic papers that appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine on December the 10th of 1981, describing both the clinical issue as well as some of the immunological defects. At that point, uh, actually before these papers, between the initial report and these papers, I made a decision in my own mind to leave what I thought was a pretty successful career studying the immunological aspects of host defense mechanisms to begin to study these individuals. My mentors, some of whom are in this room, uh, looked at me with some skepticism saying, why are you leaving a rather successful career to study a relatively small group of gay men with an unusual disease? One of them was my major mentor, Shelley Wolf. So in response to Shelley, I wrote a commentary in the Annals of Internal Medicine. You see the title there. And in it, I bring this quote back because it continues to still haunt me to today that because we don't know the cause of the syndrome, any assumption that it will remain restricted to a particular segment of our society is truly an assumption without scientific basis. I wrote that in December of 81, and it was published in June of 81. And sure enough, the MMWR chronicled what happened over the subsequent months to years. As you can see now, the expanding demography, people with hemophilia, transfusion-associated infants born of infected mothers, female heterosexual partners. Fast forward 30 years and we have what we all can consider 
without hyperbole, one of the top few pandemic disasters that we as a civilized society have experienced. You're familiar with the numbers. They're right here on the slide. I need not go over each and every one of them. In the United States, although we've become somewhat complacent, if you look at the numbers, they are really quite disturbing. More than 600,000 deaths. Importantly, 1.2 million people living with HIV, and even more importantly, 20% of whom do not know that they are infected. And 60 to 70% of new infections come from an individual who does not know that he or she is infected and transmits that infection to an uninfected partner. There's a phenomenally uh, embarrassing example of health disparities on the last bullet in this slide, when if you look at the new infections, more than 50% of them are among uh, African-American and women new infections, 70% of the new infections are among African-American women. The NIH has made a, a phenomenal investment over the years in research on HIV, totaling almost $50 billion since the early years, which now about 10 to 11% of the NIH budget is devoted to HIV. You see the flattening of that on the right-hand side of the slide, but that's the flattening of the NIH budget for all disciplines not just HIV. This is a classic example of when you make an investment in biomedical research, you get extraordinary payback. The advances in HIV science are in all the areas delineated on these bullets, some of which have played a major part by people in the audience and on this panel. For example, the initial discovery of the virus by Montagnier and Barre Sunusi and its proof that it actually is the etiological agent of HIV was one of the seminal breakthroughs that led to the kinds of things that have gone on subsequently. Delineation of the structure of the virus, its structural and regulatory genes brought great insight into our understanding the function of the virus. The replication cycle, understanding everything from the initial binding, fusion, entry, integration, and viral budding have led to extraordinary insight, which I'll get to in a moment, regarding targets for therapy. This is a slide that I drew very early on in the pandemic, uh, sort of right at the point where we were dealing on the right-hand side of the slide when patients who presented to me, to David, to, to Marty, and to many others in this audience in those early years, we knew little about the clinical course except that when we saw the patients, they were advanced. Only after we got the HIV test did we know that there was a period of time when people did not have advanced disease. We inappropriately and mistakenly called that the clinically latent stage of infection, when in fact it was not clinically latent. We just didn't realize what was going on. And this is an example of one of those things. This is a couple of papers that appeared in 1993, one from my lab and one from Ashley Haas. And you could see I referred to it as clinically latent, and Ashley referred to it as the incubation period. There's no incubation period, and it's not clinically latent. <coughs> What was going on at the time was active virus replication in the lymphoid tissue. That was 1993. We first realized that people who really looked well were in a very difficult situation with virus replication. That same year uh, came the, uh, a very important paper in science which described the ways of, very, in a very sensitive manner, measuring viral load. And it was found that at that point, at all stages of HIV infection, the virus was replicating very actively. This led to studies, and you'll probably hear about them from David Ho and his colleagues and George Shaw, in which both the viral dynamics and the lymphocyte kinetics were very sharply delineating, giving us great insight into the pathogenic mechanisms of HIV. Probably the most important advance was made in the arena of treatment. <clears throat> I dug this old slide out. That is actually me with no gray hairs on the right. In 1980s, making rounds on Building 10 at the NIH on one of our patients with HIV. The reason I show it, though it gets a giggle from people who see me at that 30 years ago, the fact is that was the darkest years of my medical career because virtually every patient I saw ultimately died. I mean, coming from a making ward rounds where you felt good that you were doing really good for people to every single day going in, virtually not being able to do anything for the patient except put a Band-Aid on a hemorrhage. However, that began to change. Again, as we delineated the replication cycle, we were able to not only screen for, but more importantly, target drug development. And rather than go through all of them, you recognize 
the classes of drugs shown on this slide, leading to what we have today is more than 30 drugs which when used in combination have totally transformed the lives of HIV-infected individuals. In fact, today, in the developed world, and this is a paper from the Netherlands, if a 25-year-old person comes into clinic who was relatively recently HIV-infected and you put them on a combination of drug, you could look the patient in the eye and say, we can mathematically model that you will likely live an additional 50 years, a sharp contrast to the six to eight month median survival that I had to tell my patients back in the summer and the fall of 1981. I can't talk about HIV treatment without just spending one minute on the role of AIDS activism in HIV science because it really was really quite transforming. This is a picture which some of the younger people may not know who this is. This is Larry Kramer, a renowned playwright and author who began the activist movement with gay men's health crisis and the ACT UP program in New York City. I, at the time, was the face of the federal government because Reagan was not talking about HIV AIDS, much to you know, his shame now as people talk about, until his second term. So since I was involved in many public issues, I was the face of the federal government. Larry did not, um, that did not go unnoticed to Larry. So he decided he was gonna attack the federal government. Larry, as you know, and this is just uh, interesting, for those of you gonna be in Washington, he wrote a play you all have to see, The Normal Heart, about the gay community in the 19, early 1980s. It won a Tony in New York two months ago. It will be playing during the International AIDS Conference at the arena stage. Well, Larry decided he'd get my attention. So on the front page of the magazine section of the San Francisco Examiner, he wrote a, a little open letter. I call you murderers, an open letter to an incompetent idiot, Dr. Anthony Fauci of the National Institutes of Allergy and Infectious Diseases. Their concern was too rigid regulatory issues with the FDA and not, a f not enough flexibility in clinical trials. So they demonstrated and they, here they are, they actually thought at the time that I worked at the FDA, so they stormed the FDA and said, Dr. Fauci, you're killing us. When they found out that I actually work at the NIH, they said, let's storm the NIH, and here's a picture of them outside our window storming the NIH. One of the things that I did in my career that was probably the best, most important thing I did, I can't necessarily explain all the reasons why, I had been reading what they were writing, and I came to the conclusion that despite the theatrical, iconoclastic approach, much of what they said was absolutely correct and reasonable. So I organized a meeting. They were about to arrest all of them on the NIH campus, brought into my conference room, which was the first of now hundreds and hundreds of meetings that we've had with the activist community that has now brought the activists into every process from regulation to the design of clinical trial. That was important in this country. It also spilled over internationally because in the 2000 International AIDS meeting at Durban, the South African group borrowed a page from the playbook of the ACT UP and other demonstrators in the United States and demanded access to therapy for, for drugs that they knew worked, whereas 25 years ago, the AIDS activists were asking for access to drugs that they weren't sure worked. They just wanted a chance, but they used the same theatrics. This ultimately led to an extraordinary evolution of international concern such that the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, the Global Fund, Philanthropies, all began an extraordinary effort to bring care, treatment, and prevention to the developing world. And here's an example. Now there are over six million people in low and middle income countries receiving care, treatment, and prevention. And in 2010 alone, 700,000 lives were saved in these countries. That's the great news. The sobering news is that less than half of them have access to therapy, and for every person we put on therapy, two people get infected. Which begs the question, what about prevention? And prevention now has loomed as one of the most important things we can do. I don't have time to go through each and every component of this prevention combination, but if you look at them, there has been a study, a clinical study using good science which has proved the efficacy of each of these. The question we have now is how do we show that it's effective when we implement it? Probably the most important of these is treatment as prevention. There was a natural tension between 
resources for prevention and resources for treatment. A study that was supported by NIH in discordant couples showed that if you start therapy early in the treated partner in a discordant couple and you put that person on antiretroviral therapy and got their level of virus below detectable level, you decrease by 96%, 96%. If that were a vaccine, that would be the best vaccine in the history of vaccinology. 96% the ability of that person to transmit virus to their partner. Now, we're all hoping for a vaccine. The fact is this, is, this is a real extraordinary challenge. There has been some hope with a very modestly effective vaccine that was tested in Thailand. We still need to discern what, if any, are the correlates of immunity. A paper appeared in the New England Journal of Medicine two months ago describing the unusual situation of non-neutralizing antibodies against an unexpected component of the viral envelope. So a lot of research is going on right now to track that down. So I want to end with something that really is very important. There have been major advances scientifically. And what we're going to be hearing about and have heard about over the past year, which will be emphasized at the international meeting uh, in Washington, D.C. next month, is that we really need to now pass the baton from the scientific advances to the implementation. And by implementation means making available therapies and preventions that we know work. And it was on this basis that now we're having a, a bunch of mathematical models that would predict what would happen if we actually scaled up interventions that we know work. And in an analysis of that, this led Secretary Hillary Clinton just a few months ago to come to the NIH on November of 2011, right before World AIDS Day, and give a beautifully elegant speech about why we can and should now put in motion the implementation that would bring us towards an AIDS-free generation. Thank you. Thanks, Tony, for that uh, wonderful overview. Uh, I couldn't believe that you could cover all that in 15 minutes, but you did it. Uh, we're going to have a series of questions here now for the panel, and then we'll open it up for, to the floor for other questions. So think of things you want to ask uh, down the road. I'm going to start with Beatrice, uh, who has done probably more than anybody, Beatrice and her group, of uncovering what was the origin of HIV in Central Africa. And she's, I'm going to ask her how she did these studies <laughs> and what she found. Beatrice? Thank you, Marty. Well, following up on, on, on Tony's uh, uh, talk, obviously everybody asked themselves, where was this disease suddenly uh, emerging from? What was the origin? And at the time, I was a postdoc in, in Bob Gallo's lab studying uh, to molecularly characterize HIV-1 and then asking the question, where did this come from? Now, Early on, we had a clue. Norm Letwin here at Harvard actually published a paper uh, describing a virus in macaques in primate centers that caused the same disease, the same symptomatology, called SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus, from macaques. But it turned out that macaques were not naturally infected with this virus. In contrast, it also became clear that they had acquired this infection in captivity in American primate centers. And the virus actually came from another primate species that was housed together in the same primate center called Sudimangabe. At the same time, uh, French investigators discovered a second AIDS virus called HIV-2 in West Africa that wasn't at all genetically related to HIV-1 that caused AIDS here and around the world. And when all these sequences were put in relation to each other in what is called a phylogenetic tree, sort of a family tree of these viruses, it became clear that the two human viruses had nothing to do with each other, but they were each closely related to a primate counterpart. In the case of HIV-2, it was a virus from the city Mangabe. In the case of HIV-1, it was a virus that was discovered in captive chimpanzees. But there was a trick to this because when People then looked in wild Sudi Mangabees. They found a, found a lot of viruses, and they found a lot of um, obvious local transmissions to humans, so this made sense. So the origin of HIV-2 was, was easy. It was a cross-species transmission through contact of humans with Sudi Mangabees. 
But the story with HIV-1 was more tricky because after the first chimpanzee viruses were discovered in captive chimps, it became clear that uh, the rest of the captive chimps, there were about 2,000 in, in various primate centers in this country and in Europe, they were all negative. So what was this? Where did this virus come from? Why were the chimpanzees that clearly had the closest relatives to HIV-1, why weren't they more infected in captivity? And the second problem was the chimpanzee viruses, which uh, by 1999, there were only three. Two were closely related to each other and two various strains of HIV-1, but one was very, very different. So people said, well, maybe chimpanzees got their viruses from still another mystery species out there. Uh, and so we, we, we got involved, uh, again, serendipitously, because a colleague ca called us up and said, I have a chimpanzee in the freezer. That chimpanzee had some infection related to HIV-1. Are you interested? I have to clean out my freezer. And I said, sure, <laughs> send it. So he, he sent uh, you know, spleen and lymph node and, and, and tissues, and we, we characterized that chimpanzee and found out that that animal who had been caught in the wild indeed had still another SIV, CPZ, chimpanzee virus that now was closely related to the two that I just talked about, different from the one. And when we put all the viruses together at the time, we realized there were actually three different cross-species transmissions from a primate species to humans having caused the M group, the main group, the pandemic form of HIV-1, but also two less widespread uh, versions, the N group, of which there are only a handful of, of, of viruses, all restricted to Cameroon, and the O group, or the outlier, again, restricted to Cameroon, uh, Nigeria, and, and, and other countries in that area. So at that point, we knew there had been three cross-species transmissions from some primate reservoir, possibly chimps, but that was all we knew. And the captive chimp population wasn't any help because none of them were infected. So we realized we had to go to the wild and we had to study wild chimps. And that's easier said than none because wild chimps are highly endangered and they don't actually like humans so well. So if you come close, not so good. Uh, and so we realized the only way we could possibly do this is non-invasively. So we looked in the literature and said, what could we possibly pick up from wild chimps? And that would be urine, feces, and hair. And what could we use for our diagnostics? And that really said hair was, was not possible, it would not be informative. And so we started to develop methods to a diagnose infection by finding antibodies to the virus in both urine and fecal samples. But that wasn't enough either. We would also have an would need to get the viral sequences out of the material to compare it to the human viruses to have an idea uh, of, of the origin. And we did that and we got lucky, it worked. We started out in Gombe National Park with Jane Goodall, and, and I have to credit her because she hated AIDS researchers at the time because they were using her chimps or captive chimps for other purposes, and she didn't like it. But she led us in to see whether any of her chimps were naturally infected. And because Gombe is, is, is a fabulous place, it's a magical park, and any one of you having an opportunity going visit, do it. It is something you, you will never forget. These chimps are habituated, which means they actually do let you approach and, and observe them from me to Jeff. That is sort of the distance, and they are individually known. Uh, uh, the, the good old people have studied these chimps since the 1960s. Their life histories are well known. They're, they have a name. Their offsprings are known. And so when we went in and we, we, we got them to collect fecal and urine samples for us, and we were excited to find the first positives, we actually had a way to go back and confirm our findings. So we said, blinded, send us samples, uh, mix them up uh, to be sure that our methods worked. And they did that. And so it was sort of a halfway house laboratory for us where we could validate our methods. And once that was done, we were ready to go where we really wanted to go, and that was West Central Africa to the areas where the captive chimps uh, were coming from that had the closest relatives to HIV-1. And we started with Martine Peters and her group to collect fecal samples in southern Cameroon, northern Cameroon, northern Gabon, and very quickly got uh, positive samples, characterized them, got the viruses out, and realized uh, 
that this is the cradle where HIV came from. These were the chimps that were the, having the precursor viruses to HIV-1. Uh, we realized that there was one region in southern Cameroon, uh, the very southeastern corner, where chimps had viruses that were so closely related to HIV-1 group M as to be the likely um, reservoir. There was another region in Cameroon, in central Cameroon, where chimps had viruses that were so closely related to the N group of HIV-1 to be that reservoir. And we realized that by looking at different geographic areas that the viruses actually stayed put because the chimps generally stay put. They don't jump on airplanes. And so we could actually pinpoint the geographic location of where these viruses came from. We also, or Martin, uh, found that wild uh, gorillas were infected and that they actually had acquired their virus from chimpanzees uh, that lived in the same habitat. And they transmitted once to humans, and that is now called HIV-1 group P. And then the O group of HIV-1, we still don't know whether it's gorillas or chimps that were uh, the origin because we haven't found the very closest genetic relatives. So that allowed us to, to really pinpoint the area where, where HIV uh, first emerged, but it didn't really explain why one of these lineages had gone global and the other one had stayed in Cameroon and infected less than 20 individuals. And so other investigators came in to see how easy is it for these viruses to spread. Uh, and they realized that there are host restriction factors that actually prevent that. Uh, and one of these restriction factors called tetherin is particularly important because it sort of grabs the particles as they try to get out of the infected cell and holds them on the surface of the cell. And tetherin, in turn, is counteracted by, by gene products of, of the virus. And it became clear that there was uh, uh, adaptation that was required going from chimps to human because as it turns out, the human tetherin could not be counteracted by the regular protein that chimp viruses have to do that. And so adaptation had to occur, uh, and it was only successful uh, in the case of the M group. The other uh, groups lagged behind for reasons we still don't entirely understand. Now, how are these viruses transmitted? We only can speculate uh, based on what we know uh, about the biology of these viruses. Uh, you know, they don't uh, get acquired through the air. It requires exposure to in either infected blood or body fluids. And while we don't have a documented transmission case, if you will, we think that bushmeat hunting, where you are exposed to large qu uh, quantities of infected blood, is the most likely scenario uh, where humans are exposed uh, to these viruses and um, likely became infected. But the interesting, the last part was we had identified the geographic region where the reservoir was, but we also knew from work of others that this was not where HIV really first blossomed and, and infected lots of people. That place was Kinshasa, uh, the then uh, capital city uh, of Zaire, now called the Democratic Republic of Congo. So we looked at, you know, there were about 1,000 kilometers between where the chimps were and where the people initially uh, started to become infected. And it was clear that probably the rivers, which, which at the time uh, when this happened, uh, which is uh, the beginning of the last century, uh, I'll talk about this in a second, rivers probably uh, allowed people to travel, infected people to travel, and somehow the virus was seeded in Kinshasa, and because this was a burgeoning uh, urban uh, city at the time, allowed it to spread uh, and have the type of secondary spread, and then from there uh, went, uh, went global. Now, we know when, about when the transmission occurred, because we now have so many sequences of, of both uh, chimp and human uh, viruses that we can back calculate, and Betty Korba did this uh, some time ago. So uh, HIV-1 group M, the pandemic strain, emerged probably around 1910, 1920, give or take 20 years. And then it went to Kinshasa, and from there uh, it seeded the world. So it's, it's really interesting. We have been able to backtrack uh, how this virus got into humans, where it came from, uh, and how it subsequently spread. And, and it, it has satisfied our curiosity, although some people always say, why, why do you want to know where it comes from? It doesn't help anyone who is infected now and is suffering. It doesn't generate a vaccine. But I disagree because I think understanding how this works helps us, helps us perhaps prevent the next uh, 
uh, pandemic. Uh, and it also helps us understand how these viruses work, not just in humans, but in other natural hosts. And as it turns out, chimps uh, uh, get AIDS just like humans do. Uh, and it gives us a, a broader sense of information to apply then back in the implementation stage, as, as Tony says, uh, to prevent perhaps future outbreaks and to use this information to perhaps make better vaccines. Thank you, Beatrice. That was great. <laughs> and, and for those of us who remember all the crazy theories that were circulating in the 1980s to finally put this on a scientific basis was a great achievement. Now, a few months ago, I heard Bob Massey give medical grand rounds at Mass General. I'd known Bob for a period of time before that, and it was really a riveting grand rounds about his experiences dealing with the variety of medical situations that he's already mentioned to you. And I'd like him, if he would, to give us an abridged version uh, this morning of some of the things he talked to us about then. Bob? Thank you. Um, I'm very grateful to be here, not only for the opportunity to be with you, but also to say thank you to the incredible work and research done by everyone here and by people represented here in the New England Journal of Medicine, which I've benefited from very uh, directly. Um, I'm able to sit here today for two reasons. One is certain genetic peculiarities about me, and the second is because of the excellent care that I was able to receive over the course of a complicated medical history. I was born with uh, severe factor VIII hemophilia in 1956, and um, uh, some of you may not be aware that causes primarily severe joint bleeding, um, and in 1956 there were no successful ways to replace the missing factor VIII protein, which allows the bud to clot. So I experienced a great deal of pain as a child and couldn't walk, had to wear leg braces. Gradually, when I turned 12 or 13, uh, certain uh, concentrated, freeze-dried products became available, concentrated uh, preparations of factor VIII, and they began to change my life, enabled me to begin to walk again uh, and to pursue more normal life and normal schooling. But there was a hidden problem in these uh, factor VIII concentrates. They were prepared from very large pools of plasma uh, that were collected from around the world, and in many cases from very poor communities, without much uh, attention to uh, the p potential underlying problems uh, in those populations. Um, very brief side story, when I was in um, high school, I had the chance, just before I went to college, I, went to work in the United States Senate for something called the Investigation Subcommittee. And uh, we were just beginning to become interested in the idea of whether uh, factor VIII was a means through which uh, various viruses, particularly at the time people were concerned about hepatitis A and hepatitis B, could be communicated. This was in 1975. And I was able to persuade the chair of the committee, Senator Henry Jackson, uh, to look into this, and they launched an initial uh, investigation about viral contamination of, of blood products. Um, unfortunately, uh, the politics of the U.S. Senate in 1975 became that the senator from Illinois, Charles Percy, stepped in, um, we assume, having been advised to do so by the pharmaceutical firms in his area, that this was premature, unnecessary, and so forth, and the whole investigation was shut down by the Republican side of that branch. Um, now, the irony of this is that if we had been able to bring that investigation forward, it might have raised the issue of viral contamination long before um, HIV and HCV appeared, might even have dealt with the issue of heat treatment and viral inactivation techniques. But that, that was a, a, uh, an instance of a near miss uh, with dealing with this um, uh, adequately. I, um, 1984, uh, went to visit my doctor in New York City, Margaret Hillgartner, who is head of the uh, hematology and uh, oncology department at uh, New York Hospital, been caring for me since I was six uh, years old. I went for an annual checkup, and she said, uh, towards the end of our meeting, she said, you know, um, uh, we have your uh, HIV results. Would you like to know what they are? And at this time, there still wasn't that much known about HIV and 
uh, persons with hemophilia. But so I said, yes, I'd like to know. So she took down two books, one very large book from one side behind her desk, and another was a book from the other side. And I had this impression that I was looking at the book of life and the book of death. And she opens the one book, and she matches my name to the number in the book. And then she opens the second book, and she finds my number. And she said, well, yes, you are, you are positive. Uh, and this was before the period where there was a lot of counseling for people who discovered their uh, HIV status. I, was I said, well, what does this mean? She said, well, we'll watch it very carefully. Um, but if your immune abilities begin to sink um, at a, to a certain point, we'll consider you have AIDS. And there really are no treatments at this point. <clears throat> now, I just want to remind those of you who went through the epidemic, this was a very uh, scary period in American history. I can remember being in a, um, a, a food store and looking down, a shopping market, and looking down and seeing um, a, I think it was Life magazine, in huge red letters that said, AIDS, now no one is safe. There was a climate of fear. There were some discussions that surfaced in the press about taking everyone with HIV and putting them on an island uh, somewhere uh, under quarantine. Uh, my father's friend, William F. Buckley, proposed uh, semi-seriously that everyone with HIV be ta uh, tattooed. Um, my father said that if that was ever seriously proposed, he would personally come down and tattoo William F. Buckley first. Um, <laughs> Uh, but that was a, deb a debate in the press. And one of the things I most admire about the medical community is that in that era of real fear, uh, popular fear, um, the medical community, so many of you here and others around the world, committed to a program of care, very aggressive program of compassion and care. Um, now, life went on for me. I got to 1995, and we had by that time learned that I had convert or that I'd been exposed to HIV. Uh, shortly after I graduated from college in 1978. So here I was 17 years uh, with HIV and my um, T cells were fine, everything seemed fine. And I finally asked my college roommate, Dr. Stephen Chanick, who's at NIH, um, how come I'm still alive? And he said, uh, Bob, I, I don't really know. And uh, he said, I said, well, do you think anyone would be interested in this? He said, yes. And that... Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> That led me to Dr. Hirsch, and Dr. Hirsch was quite curious about this, and he introduced me to Dr. Bruce Walker, and Dr. Walker uh, was perplexed, and his initial assumption was that I was not, in fact, infected. And so the first round of tests was to confirm that I, had, uh, that I was HIV positive. Anyway, that a great deal of research followed, and it got even to the point where Dr. Walker and some of his team uh, would stop by my house in Somerville to draw blood on the way in, uh, to just uh, spare me the inconvenience of having blood drawn at MGH uh, every week. Um, I once went to a party at Dr. Walker's house after a couple of years, and there were a bunch of graduate students there, um, and I had a little name tag that said uh, Bob Massey, and people greeted me. And then somebody said, you know, this is, uh, this is research subject 161J. <laughs> and they all went crazy. <laughs> They all wanted to meet me and shake my hand because they'd, <laughs> they'd been working on my uh, blood for a long time. Um, anyway, it turns out, and I'm accelerating the grand round story quite a bit, it turns out uh, after many more years that I was, uh, for genetic reasons, uh, a, the, a member of the small community of elite controllers who controlled HIV uh, through our own um, uh, genetic capacity. So the same strange lottery that had given me hemophilia out of the blue now gave me uh, this resistance. Um, now, it didn't end there. So, I mean, we now do know that I've had HIV since the fall of 1978, so that's 34 years. Um, and it was only until a year or so ago that I was put on the heart drugs, which I'll explain in a moment. Uh, it turns out that I had very, this very strong resistance to HIV, but I did not have any significant resistance to HCV, and I was probably exposed fairly early on through the same pathway of, uh, of injection of factor VIII. I began to uh, experience um, uh, increasingly severe liver cirrhosis. Eventually, it forced me to deal with the fact that I could not do my job and be treated at the same time. I was put on interferon, ribavirin repeatedly, not fun stuff, uh, for those of you who are aware of it. Um, and I finally had to step down from my job. And the cirrhosis increased. 
And I basically spent seven years on my back staring at the ceiling wondering when I would qualify for a liver transplant or if I would qualify for a liver transplant. That was from the period about 2003 to 2009. And there was a lot of twists and turns in that period, uh, whether to operate on someone who has had HIV, what to do uh, with the fact of my hemophilia, could I acquire infections that might uh, prevent the surgery from taking place, a lot of touch and go management. Um, in any case, I was called 11 times for transplant. Uh, three times I made it virtually up to the uh, operating room door before I was turned away. Uh, that's a hard experience to be dressed and ready to go and then told, actually, it's not going to work. And then finally, at Emory Medical, <clears throat> at Emory uh, University Hospital, I had been cross-listed, and they invited me to come down to be um, uh, considered to be part of a fairly complex domino transplant, a young woman who had an enzyme deficiency that caused her uh, to be able to, she could not process protein, an illness called maple syrup urine disease. She desperately needed a, a liver to pre uh, prevent neurological damage and death. Um, and, but uh, if transplanted into someone else, her liver would only cause a very slight drop in this enzyme, uh, which is produced systemically. And so they proposed that I receive her liver when she be qualified. So we flew down there. She flew up from Florida. She was put on the list. She went to the top of the list. And then suddenly my wife, who's here today, uh, who was the, the absolute bastion of support through all of this, we got a call at 2.30 in the morning uh, saying, come on in. And so I went through a transplant on July 10th, 2009, just three years ago, where they operated in two very large teams in side-by-side -side operating rooms. They put a new liver into her. They took her liver out of her, walked across the uh, room, uh, the hallway, and gave it to me. And after about six months uh, of treatment and balancing, I began to uh, improve really dramatically. And so where I am now is that um, uh, the cirrhosis is gone. Um, I'm somewhat immune suppressed, so they put me on the heart drugs just to make sure that my strong immune response had not actually been eliminated by the... Um, I went back on interferon and ribavirin. I said, why do, I, don't, why do you want to do that? That's a horrible idea. It's going to make me sick. Um, don't really appreciate the idea. They said, well, it might work, and, you know, um, we want to protect your new liver. So I put up with it for 60 weeks. They withdrew the... Uh, the um, uh, treatment, and I've had a sustained viral response of zero uh, for over a year. So I seem to have cleared the HCV virus. So the HIV is controlled, HCV seems to have disappeared, cirrhosis is gone, and when you replace someone's liver, uh, the li new liver begins to produce factor eight, so I also was cured of my hemophilia. So now my biggest problem is that I have stiff ankles and knees from my earlier hemophilia, and I'm relentlessly uh, moving through my 50s and acquiring the normal problems of a guy in his late 50s, So that's a, um, which I'm, I feel it's a privilege to have. So just to wrap up, I, I want to say um, that I am extremely aware that I would not be here except for the confluence of many different forces. First, obviously, the genetic um, lottery that put me here and kept me here in some sense. Also the fact that I happened to live in Boston and came under the rapid care of Mass General and other communities and physicians here. Um, incredible, devoted people, uh, not just physicians, but nursing staff and others took care of me during many, many hospitalizations. Um, I also am aware of my, how fortunate it is that I live in the United States. We're gonna hear from Paul Farmer. We know uh, how unbelievably hard uh, it is in other places where such medical care is not available. I would not have survived in most other countries. Um, I was constantly uh, worried that the various insurance companies that found me a burden on their system would succeed in their relentless campaign to kick me off of their insurance uh, policies. Uh, they did not manage to do so, but it was uh, tricky. And um, uh, so I'm keenly aware that that remains a problem even in the United States. Uh, so I'm very glad to be here, and my primary message at Mass General and at Brigham Women's and to you is that um, if you ever wonder whether all the hard work that you put into all of these different aspects of research and clinical care is, is worth something, 
I hope that you will remember me and people like me stretched all the way back to Horizon because we certainly want to communicate uh, one thing to you, and that is thank you. Th thank you, Bob. That was terrific, and I, I feel a little bit like David Letterman, but I, Bob has put his views uh, in a book that he just gave me this morning, and I hope you uh, go on Amazon or wherever and read this book, which uh, relates what he said this morning and much more. Tell uh, them the name of the book. The book, <laughs> the book is called A Song in the Night. It's published by Doubleday, and it's available at your local bookstore. <laughs> Uh, David, you and, and Beatrice's husband, George Shaw, have conducted the critical work on how this virus replicates and how drugs, particularly combination drugs, act against the virus. Can you relate to us a little bit about the early days in developing antivirals and how antivirals have changed the course of this disease? Sure, Marty. Uh, thank you, and, and thank you, Jeff, for the invitation. It's an honor to participate in this panel. Well, as Tony mentioned, the syndrome was recognized in 81, and three years later, it was clear that the causative agent is HIV, a retrovirus. And retroviruses have been studied largely in the cancer field, uh, so that there was a, a, a knowledge base from which to work. And it was immediately clear that there were virus-specific enzymes that were natural targets for antiviral therapy. Namely, protease, which is a chemical scissor that will process the polyproteins from big to smaller pieces. Number two, the reverse transcriptase, which converts the genetic information from RNA to DNA. And integrase, which inserts the uh, viral DNA into the chromosome of the host cell. So these were enzymes that are different from cellular uh, uh, enzymes or proteins in our bodies, and they pose as natural targets for drug development. And, and hence, uh, scientists, particularly in the pharmaceutical industry, began to screen for compounds against these targets, beginning first with the reverse transcriptase enzyme as early as 1985, uh, shortly after the recognition of the, the causative agent. And, of course, AZT is the first to emerge and many uh, follow in the subsequent years. Uh, as for the protease enzyme, the screening effort really began in earnest in the late 80s and early 90s uh, after the uh, structure of this enzyme was solved. And targets were, uh, drugs were designed to fit into the catalytic site of the protease. And, and uh, compounds began to emerge in the early 1990s. So that was one line of research. And then as Tony mentioned, there were uh, mostly academic groups like his, like those uh, in George Shaw's lab and, and my lab and, and many others that worked on HIV pathogenesis. And early on, even though we knew the causative agent was HIV, it was actually probably because of technical limitations, we were really unable to uh, readily find the virus and quantify the virus. And hence, it was thought for a long time that we were dealing with a rather quiescent or latent infection. And, and that's because a person could be infected and be well for many, many years. So this clinical latency that Tony spoke of uh, became sort of an established concept. But then as these labs began to dig into the, the pathogenesis issues, all of us began to recognize there was more and more virus there as we looked into it. And as Tony showed on his slides, a number of labs began to find that we could almost always find virus, and in fact, more and more so. So these two lines of research converged in my lab and George Shaw's lab so that we when we had the opportunity to test some of the new promising agents in, in our uh, study subjects, we designed our studies somewhat differently for 
not only to test the drug, but to understand what's going on in terms of the virus. So, for example, uh, when we first put the protease inhibitors into our uh, study subjects, uh, instead of measuring the so-called viral load at, at the starting time point and one month later, which was the, the established protocol, we actually designed uh, to collect many data points to really carefully uh, understand the rate of decay of the virus when we administer a potent antiviral agent. And by doing so, we recognized that the virus actually fell precipitously. In fact, we could monitor a log drop in a week or certainly by two weeks. Uh, and in fact, this uh, viral decline uh, is typically two to three orders of magnitude and all occurring largely in the first few weeks. And when this was worked out, of course, it, it demonstrated the potency of the agents but we had to ask the next question, why does the virus decline? Why does it decline in such manner? And work done previously had already established that for just about every infected person, there is an equilibrium between the virus and the host, the so-called viral set point. That is, the person could have a, a viral load that persists not just for days or weeks, but months and years and, in fact, decades. And so. So that equilibrium is maintained by virus production balanced by viral clearance. But when we administer an antiviral compound, what we're doing is we're precipitously blocking the production part. Therefore, the rate of decay reflects the natural clearance that occurs for years and years in an infected person. And by mathematically analyzing that, uh, George's group and our group recognized that this was a HIV infection is in fact a highly dynamic process. And we went on to do more detailed studies to characterize that. And just to give you a, a picture of this relentless process, HIV is just churning away every day in the body of an infected person who's not treated and would put out tens of billions, if not trillions, of virions progeny virions released into the circulation. Each particle would only survive in the bloodstream with a half-life of about 30 minutes. And an infected cell that's actively producing progeny virus would only have a half-life of less than one day, 0.7 day, in fact. So that HIV would undergo about 200 generations in a year in the infected person. So why, why is this all? Uh, all that important. Well, HIV is, has a reverse transcriptase. Every time it converts its genetic information from RNA to DNA, it's highly error prone. So high mutations would occur for each round of rep virus replication. Now you just imagine millions and millions of progeny viruses, each of which is undergoing this reverse transcription step. And it's doing that with 200 generations per year. You could do the math and automatically show that every possible mutation in the genome <clears throat> would occur every single day. And therefore, if you try to attack this virus, it is a mathematical certainty HIV will develop the key mutation that will evade uh, your drug. You could also do the math and show that if you force the virus to make a combination of two mutations, it's likely to do so in a matter of a few days or weeks. But if you then begin to build this mutational barrier to three to four, it becomes increasingly improbable for HIV to escape simultaneously by making a series of mutations in combination. So that was the rationale for us to then formulate the so-called combination therapy. Now, of course, Marty and, and colleagues and many others in the field have for years worked on combination antiviral therapy aiming largely for synergism and potency effect. But the con concept here to emerge from all the viral dynamic parameters is the fact that there is a second point to be uh, gained from combination therapy, and that is to erect this mutational barrier as high as possible. So with that recognition, uh, we embarked on three separate trials of 
uh, triple combination uh, therapy beginning in the spring of 1995. And, and uh, the turnaround was very dramatic in that uh, within weeks, we knew the viral load ha in every single subject had fell below detection. And different from previously, we were able to maintain the sustained effect on HIV for months. And then by the, the spring of 96, maintain that for a year. And that uh, was the first recognition of this, the so-called sustained effect of what we now call heart. And, and what came after is certainly dramatic. We never expected that in that uh, throughout the hospitals in the US in particular, uh, patients who were bedridden, uh, hospitalized, uh, had the Lazarus syndrome. They got up in a matter of weeks and returned not only to home but to work. Uh, and this phenomenon led to the emptying of inpatient AIDS units uh, throughout the U.S. And of course, as Tony pointed out, the mortality rate due to HIV AIDS in the U.S. dropped uh, sharply beginning in 1995-96. And now it's about six or seven fold lower than uh, uh, that time point. And HIV uh, is not an automatic death sentence anymore. And in fact, as Tony pointed out, uh, we could look at our patients uh, in the face and tell them that they will live for decades to come and, and uh, probably die of something else, even though they, are, uh, they have to continue to take their medications. But as this was happening in the US and in Europe, we began to hear murmurs from the developing world basically saying, what about us? And this became a loud outcry at the Durban conference in South Africa in the year 2000. And that galvanized an effort that Tony brought up and I'm sure Paul will uh, cover in, in detail, which led the UN and the US government to create programs that uh, uh, assist the developing countries in treating this uh, epidemic. But going forward, we, we we don't have a cure. What we have is control of HIV uh, infection with the use of drugs, but our patients would need to take them, at least for the given time, uh, take them uh, indefinitely. So we, we do have to uh, continue to strive forward to, to achieve a cure. Uh, in the field, people are still working on new targets. We now have drugs that attack the entry step as well as the integration step. Uh, as Tony mentioned, we have about 30 agents, some of which are combination pills uh, that we could use. This is really a remarkable achievement to have about 30 drugs for one virus infection. And then we are also developing drugs against new targets. We have been largely focused on targeting virus-specific proteins, but now there's some effort to target host proteins that could be uh, blocked safely uh, and still have an impact on HIV infection. And then folks are working on uh, new therapeutics, uh, perhaps focusing on one weakness in our therapeutic strategy, and that is patient adherence. It's really very tough to take drugs for that long period of time, uh, day after day. And are there ways we could uh, administer our therapies on a monthly basis, or on a quarterly basis? And I think, uh, I see in the, in the decade uh, forward uh, new developments uh, on that front. But for me, it is certainly remarkable to see how uh, HIV has transitioned from a, a virtual death sentence to a manageable disease. Thank you. Paul, you, you've been deeply involved in, in implementing and developing programs for healthcare, not only HIV, but all kinds of healthcare in <clears throat> multiple places, Haiti, Africa, South America, Russia, Boston. And uh, could you tell us a little bit about these programs and, and what they're doing? 
Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Marty. And I'll start by, uh, of course, thanking Jeff and Lindsay and friends at the Journal, uh, and, and also addressing myself uh, to some extent to the essay winners. Um, it's, uh, it's inspiring, I think, for many of us to see um, <coughs> young people um, taking up uh, the vocation of medicine in, in, in all of its complexity. And the complexities that we're talking about here today uh, span from, it's a, it's a, you know, this is not a very original formulation, but you, know, you can think about the three Ds, the, the basic science discovery uh, that has been discussed uh, by uh, everyone so far. It's, it's really the, the platform, if I, if I can, on which many of us build uh, our implementation or delivery, the third D, uh, efforts. In, in between discovery and delivery is development. You have to actually develop the agents. And the agents, the deliverables, here are not just uh, therapeutics, but also diagnostics and preventive. So if we, you know, the way I look at it um, is that those are those three Ds, basic science discovery, development of your deliverables, and then the delivery itself, what Tony and some of us have been calling implementation. Uh, the, the power of harnessing that for everybody who needs some health intervention, which happens to be, as far as I can tell, just about everybody on the planet, the, the power of harnessing uh, all of that, it, it can be truly awesome. And there's actually no better example, probably, uh, than AIDS to go from uh, a newly described syndrome uh, to something that can at least be managed, as David said, in, in, a, in three decades is, is a pretty awesome application of science. I'm going to, of course, focus on, uh, in my comments on the third D, uh, delivery, and what are the biggest challenges. I would like to say um, that when I think about being here today and, and, uh, and with such you know, accomplished colleagues, probably the main reason I'm here is really because I span those worlds that, that Beatrice and Bob and everyone have mentioned between a place like the Brigham and Women's Hospital and a place like a squatter settlement in rural Haiti or in rural Rwanda. So that's really the, my great innovation is actually uh, just being able to tolerate living in both those places. And I'll, 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 uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what that felt like as a, as a younger person um, and, and how it feels now um, after 30 years of doing this. As I mentioned earlier, I went uh, to Haiti between college and medical school. It was a, a very, um, the, way I, <clears throat> the way one usually tells a story, of course, in the middle of it, is as a victory narrative, right? You're, you're down there, you're working with the great people, you're getting a lot done, but it's actually not a victory narrative. It wasn't a victory at all. It was a terrible experience to be in the middle of either rural or urban Haiti and to see how paltry were our efforts to deliver medical care. I'll just give an example from central Haiti uh, where I'm proud to tell you we're about to bring online uh, rural Haiti's first proper teaching hospital, which is already, as of this week, the largest solar-powered hospital in the developing world. That's 2012, uh, and a little bit more about that in a second. But 1980. Three was a very different story. We'd set up a charity clinic, one hassled doctor, a Haitian uh, doctor, young, very brilliant uh, man, uh, totally beaten into submission by the sheer volume of pathology and the fact that we did not have effective deliverables or a delivery system that could help these patients. People were coming in with tuberculosis, a chronic uh, affliction, and they needed exactly what David described in Speaking of AIDS, combination chemotherapy delivered on a daily basis for some months. They didn't get that. Uh, maybe once in a while we happened on a proper diagnosis and therapy. Remember, this is an MD, a very accomplished and bright man, assisted by, I was just doing vital signs. There was a team of people delivering this poor quality care. Not just, uh, these are not traditional birth attendants or uh, poorly trained community health workers, but an MD, RN, people working in the pharmacy. Now, it's important, I think, to experience those victory narratives, but later to come clean and say this is not the way to deliver care. Uh, not in Boston, of course, but not in Haiti either. So uh, the next 30 years for me were really trying to repair that. And in the middle of all this, of course, there's a new rebuke to optimism, which was AIDS. So in, 19, uh, in the 80s, when I first started, uh, tuberculosis was the leading infectious killer of young adults. 
And the other list in the burden of disease was equally appalling. I mean, appalling why? Because we've known what causes tuberculosis for over a century. We had effective deliverables in principle, which is combination therapy with uh, antibiotics, again, anti-tuberculous agents. We've had those since the mid-20th century. But also appalling was maternal mortality, people dying of cerebral malaria, et cetera, the whole tawdry list. In any case, uh, in the middle of that came a new one, HIV. And uh, some people have mentioned already the kind of wild theories that sprung up at that time about, the or, uh, about what was causing HIV. I won't go into that history. Um, but uh, I came back to Harvard Medical School, came to Harvard Medical School in the fall of 1984. Actually, one of the first uh, people I heard speak <coughs> was a young, black-haired NIH leader Anthony Fauci, that uh, was 1984, and he said this. He said, there are two kinds of researchers. I can't believe you said this, by the way. Did, <laughs> you can correct me if you're wrong. So we're all sitting there enthralled, right, by this fairly young-looking dude who's a, a scientific big shot. He said, there are two kinds of researchers, those who work on AIDS and those who will work on AIDS. <laughs> and, um, and you know, I took that to heart. I, I knew that I wanted to be a clinician and that I wanted to study the big picture. I, and I later did a PhD in anthropology. But I wanted to be part of that, to responding to uh, in the dark years, as you called it. And again, people in this room remember how difficult that was, whether in Boston, you know, New York, or in, uh, any American city, or in a place like rural Haiti, where we're starting to see more and more HIV disease coming from the cities. And we did have the, the diagnostics. And uh, in the course of those years, we learned to argue about what we could do. I mean, the, the basic feeling at that time was one of extreme pessimism, I would say. Uh, and that pessimism was present in our own medical centers. As, as uh, David said, um, you know, we had our hospitals, when the time I was a medical student, going to the Mass General, the Brigham, these hospitals had a lot of people uh, very sick with or dying from AIDS at the time. And I, um, by the time I finished medical school, uh, there were still uh, a lot of people dying of AIDS. And then something happened, which you've already heard about. And, I, and that is the development of effective suppressive therapy. And in the course of one year, and I was continuing my training and, uh, in, in infectious disease, in the course of one year, we saw the wards clear out. I mean, again, I'm looking around at some of my friends from, from that era, my colleagues and teachers, it was a very exciting thing to see. So the, and and the, the, the cry that David mentions at Durban uh, in 2000, we started that, and I'm going to go back to the we, uh, because I, I hope that everybody here will have a very healthy respect, as Tony has encouraged us, for treatment activism. My view is that doctors and nurses had better be treatment activists. I mean, that's kind of our deliverable. And we started uh, pushing forward an agenda well before the development of the, of the effective uh, suppression, suppressive therapy. Uh, but by the time 1995 rolled around, or 96, we knew that this was going to be a campaign, uh, meaning all of us should be involved in, in getting the, rolling out, as the term was, uh, these therapeutics where they were needed most. And that was Africa. Um, and and uh, I'll go back to some numbers in a second. I was very caught up in my own clinical and programmatic work. And, in Haiti and, and, and uh, Peru. And again, if you, I'm not going to talk about uh, drug-resistant tuberculosis, but the whole notion of combination therapy or combination chemotherapy, of course, rang true immediately with people who had been caring for those with tuberculosis. That was the big problem in mid-20th century. Start with one agent, streptomycin. Patients will rapidly, if not as rapidly as David described, they'll develop resistance. So it really wasn't until we had combination therapy tuberculosis could be thought of as really curable. So in, uh, in Haiti, the work continued. Uh, we had, uh, were trying to build, again, I'm, my, my, uh, my brother who was uh, visiting, he, he didn't come here to hear me, he came here to hear Tony. <laughs> which is, uh, I'm a little resentful of that. Uh, he, was, he was mocking me this morning as I was talking about treatment platforms. We do abuse that term a bit, platforms. What I mean by that is putting in place a primary care system uh, that can take on all of the illnesses that you're going to see in a place like rural Haiti or rural Rwanda or rural anywhere 
And the degree of specialization that was possible uh, is, is not possible there. So for example, if you have a national AIDS program and someone comes in with a, you know, a, a broken arm, you don't say, oh no, we're the national AIDS program. You have to go to the national humeral fracture program down the road. You really have to be able to take on uh, problems ranging from uh, you know, arrested labor or um, uh, another third trimester catastrophe all the way to, again, scabies. You know, whatever the ailment is, you've got to be ready for it. So we spent a lot of time uh, in partnership building these platforms. Hospitals, yes, proud of those. Um, but also, and perhaps more importantly, uh, and I'll get back to in adherence in a second, uh, health centers that are usually nurse-run in our programs, and then, uh, and then community-based care for chronic disease. And this is, the, the, these deliverables, deliverables, I would argue, that is having a community health worker attending on a regular basis, in our case a daily basis, is also the best platform we could develop for major mental illness, for other, for other non-communicable diseases, uh, but certainly for AIDS and tuberculosis, where one of the things you wish to do is prevent the emergence of drug re resistance. You're not going to prevent it, but you can slow it very significantly by having uh, high quality, uh, and not supervised care, that's a term we used back in the 80s, we just call it accompaniment now. And that was a, a very uh, uh, exciting time for us in the 90s uh, to build these platforms, and then by 2000, I was actually in that demonstration in Durban, out, uh, along with many others, who were saying, look, you know, we have had this experience in uh, U.S. teaching hospitals, including the Brigham, where I was mostly, of seeing people have the Lazarus experience that David's uh, described. We want that for all of our patients. And the, the, this great drama, uh, you know, talking about rivers and, you know, in, in Zaire um, and people who um, wouldn't have the, the access to kind of therapy that Bob described. Um, some people, and, and again, I want to thank Tony uh, Fauci especially, were always alive to this problem. And perhaps, you know, and Tony will correct me if I'm wrong, having already quoted him from 1984, I don't think he'd dare, um, <laughs> were able to keep this big picture in their mind at the same, same time they continued their research uh, uh, in uh, pathogenesis or, uh, or how the virus worked. Not everybody can do that. Uh, and, we, we, and I think maybe you, you've credited a lot the, the activists, which is uh, gen typically generous of you. What we were saying is this is not a tenable model to think that these deliverables or these therapies are only for the rich world. That's completely an untenable and an unsustainable approach. In fact, we tried to flip this notion of sustainability which means, was being used against the delivery of these treatments in Africa. We tried to flip that over and say, you've got the sustainability argument completely wrong, and also the cost-effectiveness arguments, and all the arguments that are being marshaled to not roll this intervention out in places like rural Africa. You've got them all backwards. And it was a very difficult uh, uh, time, but we did have allies like Tony who said, we're going to do something big about this. And, and again, we'll, maybe we'll have a chance to talk about the last decade, which has been the decade of application, of implementation of some of these victories in, in areas that have never known modern medicine, never had this dialogue that the journal is describing here. And so my closing comment, uh, to the, especially to the essay winners and younger people, is think hard about partnership. Um, I mean, you, I can just go across this panel and say, Marty helped develop the therapies, but also helped protect my career when I was insisting that it was completely pr correct for a Harvard, junior Harvard faculty member to be moving between Harvard and Haiti. Um, to David, who um, you know, gave us a lot of the clinical in uh, lab insights and uh, the, the deliverables, the, the therapies themselves. Beatrice, who helped take on scientific error regarding origins and clear the air uh, which is very uh, uh, difficult. Bob, who actually sent me his braces in Haiti for earthquake victims because he didn't need them anymore, um, <laughs> to Tony, who gave us the money. <laughs> um, so uh, that, levity aside, the, you can't do this work, that is build platforms for, for delivery of services. You can't do it without money. And you can't stint on it. You can't say, well, you know, it's cost effective to have 
uh, a good teaching hospital in, in this setting, but not in another. These therapies, can't, you know, including, again, we could have the same discussion about treatment of acute leukemia. To say that that's only cost-effective here because of the political economy, medicine should reject that. I mean, the, we, we, there are other people foisting that kind of logic upon us. We have to keep pushing forward uh, bold innovation, or, or people like Bob, who t tells us a story that makes everybody want to cheer, uh, we're not going to advance if we can't reject this kind of minimalism that all too often has affected uh, uh, health services for people living in poverty. And that's uh, the message I'd like to leave people with today. Thank you. We are running short of time, but I think uh, we might have chance for one or two questions from the audience if anybody's there who wants to ask. I see someone back there. Hi. Uh, thank you all very much. My name is Mauro Caffarelli. I'm a first year, I just finished my first year at Boston University School of Medicine. And um, as much as I hate to say this to most of you, I was born in 1988. <laughs> um, and so for me, sort of the, the history of AIDS and HIV in the United States is something that I can only get from a book and from people like you who speak to us about it. But one of the things that you sort of can't help but notice is that we've, we've heard stories about successes and successes and successes and even more successes. And I think for the younger generation, we're interested in knowing in what, you know, what, what were some of the failures, what were some of the mistakes that were made such that when something like this, God forbid, should it happen again, we can be sort of cognizant of these things that we can avoid them the next time around. Well, that's a provocative question. Does uh, anybody want to try to tackle that one? Bob? I'm not a doctor. I'll keep this very brief. But <clears throat> um, just to reiterate briefly the story about uh, the unwillingness to pursue uh, the exploration of the contamination of the blood supply in 1975, um, when viral inactivation techniques like heat treatment were already being explored, uh, just to put this as bluntly as I can, if that had gone forward, and if the blood products that I was exposed to had been heat treated, about 10,000 people with hemophilia would not have died. Um, I am one of the very rare people with hemophilia my age, because virtually everyone else who did not have a genetic resistance uh, died. And so that was a combination of uh, medical misjudgment, uh, political error. There's actually a wonderful movie about this called Bad Blood by a woman named Marilyn Ness. And she doesn't lay blame on any one person, but she shows how a system can some kind, sometimes become unglued and lead to a massively negative consequence for a large group of people. David, you want? I think as... As a physician, we failed our patients uh, from 1981 to about mid-1990s, not because of lack of trying, but because we had uh, nothing to reverse the course of the disease. So that is a long struggle that we don't have time to go into. As someone working on HIV vaccine development for the past decade, I would say we have struggle and struggle, and to date we have no success to speak of, really. And, and so a, a protective vaccine is still some years away. And hopefully that will emerge to be a success story at uh, some point in the future. But we're in the midst of this, you know, a series of disappointments in the vaccine field. Uh, Mark, yeah, um, my do you have, do we have ch time for one more or? What? Go, go ahead. Yeah, uh, my name is uh, Michael Grodin. I'm from Boston University School of Public Health. Um, a person who sadly is not here, uh, who, would, who should be on this panel, who died prematurely is Jonathan Mann, who was the first head of UNAIDS. But I wonder if you could comment on the uh, HIV AIDS was the seminal event, really, which revealed the inextricable link between health and human rights and the relationship between empowerment of women and discrimination and the, and the social uh, social justice issues that related to uh, the pandemic. Paul, do you want to? Yeah, I'll, I'll give that a try. As um, someone was lucky enough to, to work with, with Jonathan and others who were uh, underlining uh, what some would call a structural risk. Um, and, you know, it's kind of a goofy term in a way, but talking about poverty, gender inequality, I would say those are the biggest drivers 
of the epidemic. Uh, if you look at labor migration, for example, in southern Africa, which is clearly deeply linked to risk, it's related to, uh, to uh, the lack of a job. And so we don't have um, good preventives for that. But this, back to the previous question, we can also say that we've failed pretty much uh, to, to link these obvious structural causes to robust structural interventions, job creation, uh, again, social justice program. But that's not out of reach. We can still do that and do our jobs as scientists, as people working on delivery of medical care. And I think uh, we have a long way to go, obviously. So I want to thank the panel, uh, Marty, for uh, hosting and organizing it, uh, David, Beatrice, uh, Bob, uh, Paul, and Tony. I want to thank all of you for participating uh, in this. Uh, we have a break to 11. We will start right on time. And my final plug is that uh, David was a member of HST, the Health Sciences and Technology Group, in which I teach. And I always say that's the group of people for whom differential equations are a solution and not a problem. <laughs> And he's a living example about how that knowledge really made a difference in getting us better. So have a cup of coffee and come back in a half an hour. And thanks to this panel. <laughs>